there were several questions raised that I wanted to mention concerning John chapter 11. One question was, why is it that if, if Lazarus was dead four days and raised on the fifth, how do we get uh, the number seven out of that? How do we get tabernacles out of that? What I'm saying is this, that La Lazarus being raised on the fourth day has double symbolism. There's more than one thing happening here. One is, yes, he was raised on the fifth day from his death, which is a picture of trumpets. It's a picture of life in the spirit. It's a picture of being ushered into the sixth aspect of redemption, which is deliverance from sin. That's why he, uh, when he arises, he is bound and needs to be, and needs to be loose. However, we get the number seven if we start from the time that Jesus was told about Lazarus dying. And remember it said that he waited two days. And then he, he announced plainly, Lazarus is dead. And said then that he wanted to go to Judea. And they said, well, don't do that because, you know, remember the Jews will, will stone you. And so it took him evidently four days to get to Judea, to get to uh, Beth, uh, Bethany, which is just on the backside of the Mount of Olives. It's, it's less than two miles away. And so this suggests to me, and I have not confirmed this with, uh, with any historical scholarship yet, I would, would like to, that Jesus probably ministered those four days in, uh, in uh, Judea, in the environs around that part of, uh, of Israel, and then proceeded to, uh, to Lazarus. And so six days had transpired, the two days in which Lazarus was sick and then the four days in which Lazarus was dead, show, uh, therefore bringing us to Lazarus being raised on the seventh day. Now, the second question was concerning this, uh, the light of walking, uh, you know, there's 12 hours in a day, and, and what about this light that, uh, that you walk by? And let me see if I can dramatize this uh, carefully. If you are walking at night and you stumble, it's because the light was not in you. That's what Jesus uh, says in verse 10, John 11, verse 10. If a man walks in night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. I would add to that that if a man walks during the night and does not stumble, it is because light is in him. So, walking at night is an opportunity that demonstrates whether or not light is within you. If you stumble, you, there is no light in you. If you do not stumble, there is light in you. Correspondingly, the day, it's awfully hard to stumble during the day. But just because you walk in the day and don't stumble is not an indication that you have this light in you. Walking during the day and not stumbling, that's easy. All you have to do is walk by the light of the world. And that's the problem. Because in tabernacles, what happens is that Christians are tempted to say, well, look, I'm doing okay with the Lord. I study my Bible. I attend faithfully the assembling of the saints. I'm overcoming sin. I'm not the same person that I was before. And I'm not stumbling. Well, the Christian can be walking by the light of the world during the day and not be stumbling. And it doesn't occur to him that he's walking by the inappropriate light until night comes. In fact, that's the purpose of night. You see the same dilemma with the foolish and the wise virgins. While they were together and preparing, everything was fine. They were together. They, they understood the same things. They heard the same things. They did the same things. But at the midnight hour, 
that becomes an opportunity that discloses whether or not what you are doing is is founded in the presence of Christ or whether it's founded in something that has ignored what Christ is doing. And by and large, church life operates by the light of the world. We appeal to the modes of entertainment of the world. We, we copy them. We use fundraising mechanisms that the world uses. We use organizational concepts that the uh, world uses. We're walking by the light of the world. And we say, well, we're not stumbling. We're doing fine. Well, that's okay as long as it's day. The man that walks during the day will not stumble because he walks by the light of the world. But let night come. And the light of the world no longer available. The only way you can refrain from stumbling is if this other light has been worked in you. And that's a, 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 a very important aspect of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's, it's the willingness to have this new light planted in you during the occasion where it's not even needed, during the light of the day. It's, uh, it's unsettling, but why, why would the Lord delay a gratification along this line? Why, why, why would he possibly um, uh, not permit this to happen? Well, the reason is because he is, he is teaching you while it is day how to live at night. Then when the night is revealed, you have a light that is sufficient. And as the earth experiences the Feast of Tabernacles, it itself must be plunged into the earth's darkest night. And in that night is when the light of the church will shine like it has never shown before. And that's in Isaiah and in other places in the scriptures. So sometimes Christians feel that there's no need for a complete relationship with the Lord, and they cite their own life as uh, as kind of, but I but I don't have these kinds of problems. Every, everything is okay, and this is a lesson that shows us that's not um, that's not sufficient. Uh, it's it certainly is prudent not to go as Jesus as the disciples warned Jesus. It's prudent not to go where they're going to stone you. But in tabernacles, you learn to walk by a different light, and it may be what is needful. And uh, what comes to my mind is uh, smuggling Bibles into China or Russia. You'll get yourself into trouble if you do that. But if God has kindled a lamp within you to that end, they can't touch you. See, one is common sense and practically you don't invite disaster you'll get arrested and never be seen again but if there's a lamp see that's by the light of the world that's good practical judgment there's nothing wrong with that but there's another relationship and that is where God lights this blazing lamp that is within you and it is only seen and measured and known when it becomes dark and, uh, and it is then that you will not stumble any other questions? Now, I wanted to, we want to turn to John uh, chapter 12, but I wanted to remind you of several of the episodes of the Feast of Tabernacles, especially that portion which is still celebrated today called the Hallel which is the reciting of Psalms 113 all the way through Psalms 118. And remember, they would, um, they would recite these Psalms, they would hold palms in their hands and, and wave them and shout and rejoice. And, uh, and as they would come during the Feast of Tabernacles, drawing the waters from the, uh, from the pool of uh, Siloam, uh, hold your finger in, on John 12. I want to show you Psalms uh, 118 because it will help you to see why it is that the sense of tabernacles, even though we are in, in this time in the life of Jesus, we are upon Passover. And the remarkable thing is the sense of tabernacles pervades 
the feast that we saw in John 7 all the way through the six month period of Christ until the, uh, until the Passover where he was crucified, uh, buried, and raised. Now, uh, in, in the 118th Psalm, there were three verses that when they were recited, the participants would shake their palm branches. The, uh, the lulav, it's called, uh, the palm. It's, and the three verses are verse 1, verse 25, and verse 29. Verse 1 says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endures forever. Verse 29 says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. So it, it begins and ends with the same thought. And so they shake their palms at the first verse of the 118th Psalm and the last verse. The, the third time they shake their, psalm, their palms excuse me, is in verse 25. And that says, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity, or send now well-being, or send now uh, deliverance. In Hebrew, that first portion of the phrase says, Ana Adonai Hoshiana. We beseech you now, Lord, save, we pray. Now, that may not uh, strike a chord in you, but it, but it shall in this chapter. Because the episode in this chapter is appealing directly to the Feast of Tabernacles. It is unmistakable. So, that's, uh, so I want you to keep that in your mind, and then we'll see uh, how it's fulfilled here in uh, John chapter 12. Then Jesus, John chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. So he had uh, left Bethany and now had, uh, had returned. R remember, he went to uh, Ephraim. Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which, uh, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now, this episode is not uh, amplified here at this uh, portion, but elsewhere in, um, in the Gospels it is. Do you remember the story where um, Martha is busy in the kitchen serving, and Mary is at the feet of Jesus? And finally, Martha can't take it anymore and she says um, to Jesus look you know I'm working hard and she's not helping say something to her now that is a picture of tabernacles that's a picture of the two uh, two senses of how a Christian is related to the Lord the one is working doing their job. She belonged in the kitchen. He was invited. They had a remarkable guest in their home, had done a remarkable mi uh, miracle, and uh, you ladies probably could tell us, uh, you know, what, uh, what goes through uh, your mind when you have such a guest and you want everything right. But Mary is at his feet, just soaking in everything he has to say, who he is, what he is. And that's the difference between tabernacles and not yet entering into tabernacles. And notice the gentleness of Christ when he says to Martha, Oh, Martha, Martha, you, you trouble yourself too much. He says, Mary has chosen the better part. Tabernacles is the choosing of a better relationship to Jesus Christ. Where what is more important is not doing for the Lord. What is more important is the Lord himself. And it may mean leaving the dishes in the sink, so to speak. 
and it's offensive to the natural man, but the spiritual man hungers after Christ and therefore is only interested in a relationship that is completely fulfilled by a direct relationship with Jesus. This is independence of doing things for him. And that's important. That's an important characterization. So it's in that sense, see then, uh, verse 3, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. We mentioned that last time. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Her service to Jesus in this regard uh, kind of just took over. I mean, this, this was obvious to everyone what it is that, uh, that she was doing. The odor of it, the act of it. And then, of course, you have uh, Judas nearby. Uh, one of his disciples, uh, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. This is what he says. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, there is always present, until the Judas part of the assembling of God's saint is driven out of us, in the last days, there's always this rationale. This sounds so right. Of course we need to minister to the poor. Of course we don't waste uh, on ourselves. We, we, we are always outgoing and generous. And that's the edge, see, because this is something spiritual that is being said but it is totally antagonistic to tabernacles. Totally antagonistic to tabernacles. But it sounds so spiritual. Does he mean it? Is, G is Judas's heart broken for the poor? No. No, and that's what we see in the next, um, uh, in the next verse. He says, this he said... Not that he cared for the poor. And see, that's why we need to realize not everything that is said is all that sincere. You, 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 we need another way of judging what it is that people say because some, most of the time, things that are said are said because of other motives that are present. And as you grow in the Lord, you, you find yourself much more sensitive to these other motives. Remember it says of Jesus, this... This thing he, 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 knew, he knew what was in their hearts and what they were, what they were truly, truly doing. So he's really thinking about himself here. And that is so characteristic of, uh, of the humanism that enters into the church. You know, it sounds so right that mankind will be benefited, but really it's because they themselves will be benefited. It only sounds right. It itself is not right. And sometimes we are... reluctant to respond to this because it makes us sound like we are harsh and cold. How easy is it for us to respond the way that, uh, that Jesus did? But, uh, but then said Jesus, let her alone. And that's what Jesus says about uh, those, of, uh, those of us who are, are, are being drawn into him. Don't trouble her. What she's doing is right. Against the day of my burying has she kept uh, this. And, and not only that, it's also against the day of her own burying. See, she is offering to him that which is the most precious. And, it's, and the reason why she is joined in with this is because we are crucified with Christ. See, in Romans chapter 6, being buried with him by baptism. So... Tabernacles is where we find the completion of this process of offering all that we are. This is the, the finest and the most fragrant of all of the offerings. All that we are, just as I am. Lord, here it is. It's very reminiscent of how we first came to the Lord. And that's why there's a very strong relationship between tabernacles and Passover. But this is where we are able, as it says in Romans 12, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. 
totally acceptable under God. And this is Jesus' answer. And this uh, sounds a little cold, doesn't it? He says, the poor you always have with you, but me you have not always. Why isn't this callous? Partly because he knows he knows Jesus's, Judas's motives. That's right. And notice how he's actually being generous, isn't he? He, he could say publicly, "Ah, oh, this Judas cares nothing, nothing for the poor. It's because he's holding the bag." But he didn't. In an offhand way, it almost seems like he's he's saying, "Don't be don't be troubled with the poor because." The fact that they are always here means that it, it doesn't seem to concern God all that much. Uh, it's just like a normal expectation that they're, they're going to be poor there. And if, if it was a concern to me, then I'd say so and I'd do something about it or I'd make provision for them. But there's something more that's important than the poor. There's something that is more important than the poor. We should not be left with the impression that if we work real hard, we can solve the problem of the poor. See, the poor you always have. But the deeper lesson here is that what is present is not always here. That's what makes it prudent to minister to Jesus rather than the poor. He's comparing the two. I'm not always going to be here. While I am here, move. This other, you'll, you, can, you can take up this matter at another time. It'll be something that you can give yourself to later. You have time for that. This is the appropriate time for me. And that is important concerning your personal fulfillment of the tabernacle's experience. When Jesus draws near to you, as it says in Revelations uh, chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That is the time to open the door. Not to say, Lord, I just married a wife, just bought a cow, lands I haven't seen, oxen I haven't proven, I cannot come. As Jesus draws close to you, he requires you to respond to him, and often to the exclusion of pressing circumstances, like the dishes need to be done, reminding us of, uh, of Mary and Martha. What he is saying is that Mary here is taking advantage of something that is passing. Never again will she be able to do this. This is this moment of time for her, and she has chosen it quite well. When I'm gone, there's all the time in the world to sell what you have and give it to the poor. That we should do. But never, ever, the things that are right are never, ever to eclipse our relationship with the Lord. And there comes a time when Jesus moves upon you and expects a response. That is when you respond. Remember how Mary stayed in the house. And when Jesus says, come, she rises quickly, and she goes and she meets him. That's characteristic of tabernacles as you are drawn in. You find yourself responding to the wooing of your master, whether it's 3 o'clock in the morning, at a busy day in work, you'll, you'll sense his presence, and you'll just pause and rejoice. My soul doth magnify the Lord. I rejoice in the God of my salvation. Praise the Lord. Don't ever let the duties eclipse. The duties are still duties. They must be done. But never to the exclusion of your relationship to Jesus himself. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might, that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. This was this was. A remarkable thing, both Jesus and Lazarus. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many Jews went away and believed on Jesus. 
And that shows you the level of perversity that can arise in the midst of God's people. And we, of course, are equal candidates for this kind of thing. Do not resent when you see the glory of God displayed in someone else. Do not resent it. It's tempting. Do not do it. Isn't that perverse? To want to put Lazarus to death because Jesus had, uh, had raised him? Because it was such a marvelous uh, work of God that uh, everyone was believing and they did not want that. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees. These are the lulav. And went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. And they are reciting. That word Hosanna is the Greek transliteration of Ono Adonai Hoshiono. Save now, I pray. They are reenacting the Feast of Tabernacles. They know that this is the coming of the king. And the Feast of Tabernacles is so much a part of their thinking during the season. This is six months after the feast. But the presence of God must have declared such a witness that this one who is coming is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's what we, we call this Palm Sunday, don't we? I, uh, this is five days before, uh, uh, before uh, Passover. And they are, they are crying Hosanna, which is a direct, uh, they, are, they are citing the 118th Psalm, verse 25 and, and verse 26. Blessed is the King of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, and this is Zechariah 9.9, 9, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. Now, Jesus knows that this gesture is important. He does not shirk from this, does he? He knows the crowds are gathered. They're waving palms. Correspondingly, he takes to himself the means to actually enhance it to the point where it fulfills prophecy. He, went, he goes and he finds this, uh, this cult. This demonstrates two aspects of tabernacles. Because on one hand, he is specifically doing that which fulfills the word of the Lord directly. It's a direct fulfillment. It's this is this is this is pleasing to the Father that this episode occurs. But the second aspect that gets joined with that and must it, Jesus does not come in riding a horse. He's riding a donkey. Showing his lowliness. He could, have, he could have come in on a chariot say, and, and arrogantly displayed his majesty and power. But that's inconsistent with his calling and with the sense of being drawn to the glory of the Father. Yes, the scriptures are fulfilled, but at the same time is a sweet humility, a true lowliness, it's, it's the lowliness of a servant who is content to serve. Remember it says, though he were a, a son, he thought it not something to grasp. Concerning uh, uh, his relationship with the father. These things understood not his disciples at the first. And that's, that's how tabernacles works. You know, you'll pass through experiences which are, which are leading you to the fullness of redemption, but you don't understand them. 
And then after, sometimes months, even years after, the Lord then shows you the glory that was revealed through this incident. And that, that happens to the disciples and it happens to us too. These things understood not the disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, and that's when you truly understand, when Jesus is glorified, and we'll see this uh, shortly, make sure that as you grow in Christ, people are applauding Jesus and not you. Yeah, that's the temptation of tabernacles, is to grasp the glory to yourself. So when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bore a record. And you always find another group who is watching what is going on and declaring that this indeed is a work of God. And, and it's for this cause the people also met him that they had heard that he had done this miracle. The reason why they assembled on this day we call Palm Sunday, the reason why they were there was because Lazarus was raised from the dead. The Pharisees uh, uh, said, uh, therefore among themselves perceive you how you prevail nothing Behold, the, the whole world has gone after him. It's, uh, this, is, this is getting out of hand. So correspondingly, they were tempted all the more uh, to taking stronger measures. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. So you will always find the nations present. The same came therefore to Philip, which was by Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And that is what the nations are truly hungering for. They just want to see the Lord. They don't want to see the church. They don't want to see our outward forms. Uh, all they want. Isn't that a, what a plaintive cry? Sir, we would see Jesus. That's what they hunger and thirst for. And Philip comes and tells Andrew, and Andrew uh, and Philip tell Jesus and I think that's how that's how tabernacles gets uh, gets to be understood it's as it's as God joins us one to another and uh, I think there, there's a suggestion here of see, it, it begins just with uh, Philip and Philip tells Andrew and then they both come to the Lord this this is a picture of the of, of the nations coming just beginning a little by little and then growing into a mighty swell until finally it's the, it's the whole world uh, celebrating the feast. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Tabernacles is the celebration of the ingathering of the fruit. And this tells us there is only one root to this kind of fruit bearing in the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is to be sown as seed. And when seed is sown into the ground, it disintegrates. It loses its identity. What it is, is gone. It dies. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit because in the seed contains the potential to bring forth not only life directly. See, something is produced if you plant a fruit tree. It will bring forth the fruit but there's a secondary fruit bearing, and that is the fruit itself contains seed, which then can be sown. This shows us that tabernacles is not only something which affects you. You bring forth much fruit which pleases the Father. 
But in so doing, this fruit that you bear itself becomes the candidate to be sown again and bring forth much greater fruit. And that is why the soul that through patient continuance in the Lord will allow himself to be sown by the Lord and be brought low and into the dark, damp earth, so to speak. Because out of that process, not only will you bear fruit directly, but multitudes will be affected by your single obedience in being sown. And that is because in that one seed is, a, is an entire orchard, multiple trees. But if that one seed will not die, that fruit will not be born. The Feast of Tabernacles is the complete fulfillment of fruit bearing of the individual Christian to the extent that many are affected. And that was the promise to Abraham. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's a picture of tabernacles. Then Jesus explains the significance of this. He that loves his life shall lose it. Tabernacles drives at the very core of what it is that you are and requires that you yield what you are to the master. He that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. That's important. We'll see this when we get to John 14. The question that is important to answer is where will you be? Those who are with the Lord are those who serve the Lord. Tabernacles brings us into the relationship of serving God faithfully without regard to our own interest, without being self-pleasing or self-glorifying. We simply serve the Lord. And there are two remarkable things that happen because of that. The one is that we will be with him. And the second is that the Father will honor him. Those are two unmistakable rewards or components of the Feast of Tabernacles. That where I am, you may be also. That's John 14. But imagine the Father honoring you. We're so used to honoring the Father. But when redemption has had its complete work, God himself arises on your behalf and announces to all of the creation. Remember, uh, Jesus said, He that is ashamed of me, I will be ashamed. But he that confesses of me, I will confess. And so through the process of confessing Christ, Jesus stands and confesses your name. I'm sure we'll be embarrassed half to death. Jesus will say, let me tell you about this one. And then the Father will do the same. The Father will honor you. Isn't that remarkable? But that's tabernacles. Now is my soul troubled. This process is not without pain. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause I came unto this hour. And so as God is bringing us as this seed into the dark earth, so to speak, where the seed is planted and begins to disintegrate, your soul will be troubled because you will find yourself being separated from your Adamic nature. The thing that you were so comfortable with begins to be driven from you. It begins to lose its life. But you cheer yourself and say, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to say, Lord, save me from this? No, because this is the very thing that I am called to. 
Father, glorify thy name. Then a voice came from heaven. There were only a few times in the ministry of Jesus that a voice came. Can, can you recall them? One was at the baptism of John. Where Jesus was present, you mean? On the Where the Father spoke from heaven. On the Mount of Transfiguration. On the Mount of Transfiguration, and this is the third one. Then a voice from heaven, then there came a voice from heaven. This is the Father responding to the Son. The Son says, Father, glorify thy name. He says, Father, I'm, I'm not going to say to you, deliver me from this. This is the reason why I came. And in cross-carrying obedience, I will see this fulfilled. And the Father responds verbally, audibly. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, there's mass confusion here. They, they don't know what happened. Jesus hears the voice of the Father. Psalm says it thundered. Th these are the folks who are uh, walking by the light of the world. It probably sounded like thunder. And the clouds were probably dark, and maybe there was even a stroke of lightning uh, just moments before. So they're convinced it was thunder. Then there are others who are a little more spiritual, and they, can, uh, they knew, no, no, this wasn't natural. This was supernatural. This was an angel. An angel was speaking to them. But that shows you the various levels of sight that a Christian can have. You can see precisely what happened, and that is that the Father had spoke. You could make it a spiritual episode, an angel spoke, or you could make it natural and say, it was, uh, it's just thunder. Again, let me emphasize, tabernacles is not easily understood unless you have sight and it, that sight, that light, that presence that is, that is developed within is the necessary component to, to know the difference between whether it was an angel, thunder, or whether it's the Father. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me. He didn't need this. But for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. This is the... Jesus now is ready to be sown. And when he is sown, he will be reaped. And through that reaping of Christ, that seed, he is the first begotten from the dead, it says in the scriptures. And out of that process, the nations shall be gathered to Christ. Now there's a double meaning here when Jesus said, if I be lifted up. The first meaning of that is being lifted up upon the cross. And that is the sense that they understood immediately, as we'll see momentarily. There's another meaning here that Uh, we, we talked about a little earlier, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. If you will speak of Jesus, if you will lift him up, if you have your speech seasoned with grace, don't quarrel with people. Tell them about Jesus. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And what a difference. Tell them how wonderful the Lord is. And their responses will be to be drawn to him. This he said, signifying what death he should die. And the people answered him. They always want to quarrel. Why is this? The carnal mind, the spiritual mind that has the, this, this fleshly bent, wrestles scriptures to their own destruction, as, as Peter said. We have heard out of the law that Christ abides forever. And sure enough, there, there are some verses, uh, the 89th Psalm, I guess, and the uh, 110th Psalm that says, uh, Thou art uh, uh, a priest forever, uh, the, the son of, uh, you know, the priest of, uh, how's that go? Thou art a uh, priest forever of the order of Melchizedek. So they knew Messiah was, uh, was to live forever. And so Jesus says, I'm going to die. They understood that. And so immediately they want to quarrel. And so why do you say that the Son of Man be listed up? And who is the, uh, this Son of Man? 
And Jesus' answer keeps the emphasis where it needs to be placed. Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walks in darkness knows not where he goes. While you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. So as you patiently follow the Lord, and he gives you a glimpse here and a glimpse there. Perhaps something needs to be repented of. So perhaps there's a relationship that really needs to be restored. Some light that the Lord gives you. Be sure you walk. Get on your feet and walk according to the light that God shows you. And in so doing, you become the children of light. You become filled with light. If you don't, that light is not kindled properly as it should. And instead of having within you a multi-flamed lampstand, many of the candles are snuffed out, and making it much, much more difficult for you. Too difficult. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of, of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled when he spake, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So as the church historically experiences the Feast of Tabernacles, which it shall as we proceed toward the coming of the Lord, as Israel is restored and, and, uh, and the majesty <clears throat> and the glory of God is poured out upon the church and the nations of the church, uh, the nations of the world, uh, We'll hear the, the, the gospel of the kingdom, as, this, as Jesus said in the Matthew 24. In the presence of all this will be mighty unbelief. Even though the testimony of the church is there, there will still be many who will not believe. And in the last days... Those who will not believe are held the most accountable because the mightiest of witnesses were present. And even though as the spirit of Antichrist arises in the church and, and does his number to snuff out the, this lamp that is lit, you can read it in Revelations chapter 11, a, apparently succeeding, just as Satan apparently succeeded in putting Jesus to death, see, thereby snuffing out the lampstand. Out of that whole process comes a greater fire that cannot be extinguished. Do you remember the story of um, Pilgrim's Progress where Pilgrim uh, made it to uh, Palace Beautiful? Have you ever read Pilgrim's Progress? You should. It's a, it's a wonderful allegory. He made it to uh, Palace Beautiful and was being shown around the various rooms and um, in one room, there was fire proceeding out from, uh, from the baseboard of a wall. This great fire. And uh, there was this ugly creature there with buckets of water and would heave uh, this water on the fire. And, and the fire would be greatly subdued. And then a moment later, the fire would just roar back up again. This, this, this would anger this, this creature, and he would take another bucket of water and throw it on the fire and subdue the fire. And moments after, the fire just burst up into flames. And this kept going on and on. And, and, uh, and Pilgrim said uh, to, the, to the lady that was showing him around, what, what does this mean? She says, come, I'll show you. And they went down the hall to the adjacent room. And there was an angel of God with many vessels of oil. And the angel of God was taking the oil and pouring it on the baseboard. You know, so Satan was quenching it, and the angel was, uh, was rekindling it with the oil of God. And that's a picture of the vicious cruelty of Satan when the very majesty of Christ is manifested in Christians. And yet at the same time is a good picture of the way that God responds in adding grace so that this flame just, just comes back all the more uh, greatly, all the more powerful. 
So even as we walk through the days of the greatest darkness this world has ever seen, there is oil present. And any snuffing out that Satan does is just the most mediocre and the most trivial uh, feat attempt at, at quenching the fire of God. And it is actually the very occasion by which God himself enables all the more. And so, yes, uh, he, uh, he defeated the Son of God and saw to it that he was put to an open shame. But then Jesus turned and did the same thing. <laughs> he returned it in like kind to Satan and led, he led him to uh, uh, in, in open shame. So... You, you always find that these things are fulfilled, as it says in verse 38, uh, uh, the, that the sayings of Elijah, the prophet, might be, Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled when he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. They should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and, and spoke of him. And so at the very time that the nations are raging, the church is experiencing tabernacles. We are seeing the glory of God. It is, the, it is to their destruction because they won't believe the report. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. There is always a remnant. There is always present those whom you would ordinarily assume are not believing because externally it looks like nothing's happening. And, and why aren't these Jews, these chief rulers, that makes them part of the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling governing, the eldership of the assembling of, uh, of Israel. Why, uh, why wasn't it known that they uh, were believers? Well, because of the Pharisees, as it explains. They did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So they were sensitive to their position, and they did not want to compromise it. But at the same time, they believed in the Lord. And I believe that this remains to this very day that because of the fear of the response of others who are companions, the belief in Messiah is not manifested, but nonetheless in the individual's heart, it is present and it is real, and it is counted, the Lord counts that. These are, the Bible has an expression, these are the disciples by night. Remember, who was it? Uh, Nicodemus uh, came by night. And that's their best shot. And it's okay. It's okay. Especially as a servant of the Lord, you, you'll be surprised how often it's the disciple that by night uh, that has the cave to um, see. Uh, Joseph of, of Arimathea was, uh, was a disciple by night. He, he wouldn't uh, come forward. And yet he was the one who provided the cave. And, and, and in the very darkest hour. He went to Pilate himself and begged for the body of Jesus. And that's how the disciples of night work. It looks like they're going nowhere because they fear man. But because of the faith that they truly have, at the hour where something needs to be done, they'll do it. And you'll see it yourself. They will, they will minister to the body of Christ. And if need be, go, through, go to civil authority. That's remarkable. Don't ever despise the disciples by night. They have a way of coming in at the 11th hour with a heroic that benefits other believers. Jesus cried and said, He that believes on me believes not on me, but on him that sent me. And I hope, my prayer, for Israel is that they believe this, that they see this. Because the Jews are offended at the concept of worshiping Jesus. They're offended at his deity. 
But see, in tabernacles, Jesus' deity is just a conduit which leads them to the God of Israel. And the Jews need to hear that. He that believes on me doesn't believe on me, but believes on him who sent me. He says, when you receive me, it's not really me. It's the Father that you're receiving. I pray that that become clear to the nations of the earth. And he that sees me has seen him that sent me. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. If any man hear my words and believe not, now if we were to finish that verse, we would say they'd be crushed. No, see that's not. In tabernacles, you quit your railing, sharpening your axe, grinding and grating your teeth against things that don't work as you feel they should or people who won't believe. He says, I do not judge them. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. So he has a different motive here. And if you go judging and crushing people because they don't have it well understood, you ruin your opportunity to save them. So Jesus will do this. He lets it go. He gives them latitude. He says, what will judge them is the word that I speak. I won't judge them. Won't do it. He that rejects me and, and receives not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. And I can imagine that perhaps the Lord will play simultaneously Let's say someone who rejects the Lord simultaneously dramatizes their life along with a dramatization of the Word of God so that the two side by side can be compared and either they are the same or dissimilar. And of course it will, show, it will be shown to be dissimilar. And that is where the process of judgment comes from. It's not because someone has it all analyzed and, and has it figured out. It's because it bears its own testimony in the light of the testimony of the scriptures. And no more is needed. Isn't that interesting? And again, a, another emphasis of tabernacles. For I have not spoken of myself. See, that's John the Baptist. He must increase. I must decrease. Jesus did refuse to glorify himself. I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And the Feast of Tabernacles brings you into a keen awareness of what you should say and what you shall speak. You no longer speak of yourself or on your own behalf but what you say you do because the Father directs you and that is an experience it is an experience to be transformed from a Christian that basically does as well as they can lives by their wits and their own common sense and their better judgment between that and the one who is directed by the Lord himself, what they should do and what they should say. And when God is directing you with that kind of a guide, you have entered into the rest of God because there's no need to strive. You speak as he directs. If he directs to refrain from speaking, you do so. If, the, if it's received, fine. If it's not received, fine. It's of no consequence because you're being obedient to the Father. 
And the Feast of Tabernacle achieves this transformation from the Christian life where you just kind of figure out the best you should do and how things should work, which is where most of us are, to transformed into the one where the Father leads and guides you on a regular basis, directly. The Father shows me what to say, that I say. The Father shows me what to speak, and that I speak. Then it will be said of you, you don't see me. What you see is not me at all. I am crucified with Christ, but it's not me. It's Christ. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He that receives me, Jesus said, receives the Father. And the reason for that is because what he does is the Father. It's the works of the Father. So re the process of receiving what Jesus says and what Jesus does is the process of receiving what the Father is, what the Father says, what the Father does, because there's no difference. Can you see that? That's tabernacles. What happens commonly in Christianity is this earthen vessel gets in the way. We either elevate it or we, we glorify it, and correspondingly what we are receiving is the vessel, and the vessel cannot save. The transformed vessel brings true life. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say, what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Notice the emphasis on that. This is, this comes about, and we need to close, only through prayer. Drawing near to the Lord in such sweet communion that you gain understanding what you should say and what you should speak. And not, there is no other substitute for that than prayer. Praise the Lord. Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we look to you, Lord. We don't want to be led by our own ideas. We don't want to glorify man. But, Lord, we do want to be drawn into this sweet union with you, Lord, where we see you as the fountain of the Father's thoughts. Where...